Use the handheld. You guys hear this? All right. Hope you guys are doing well. And um, we're here tonight. Some of you guys came last week and we weren't here, so uh, praise the Lord. Your pastor didn't die in a lake. Amen. <laughs> no joke. That is no joke. And we're still in the book of Revelation, so you haven't missed anything. And uh, today's the last letter we're going to look at. The Church of Laodicea, and um, so we'll dive into that, and the next week we will be in Revelation chapter 4, which is uh, after the church age, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that next week, what that is, what does that mean, what does that look like, um, and different points of view on Revelation chapter 4, because Revelation chapter 4 is where many people believe the rapture happens, and so we'll talk about that next week. But tonight, we're in verse 14 of chapter 3, and... Um, we're just going to go after it and uh, kind of go from there. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. So God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for allowing us to be here. I thank you for every person that made it out tonight. The man, I pray that you protect them, that you bless them, that you speak to them tonight for those watching online, and uh, that you comfort them, bring them peace. God, I pray that you open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our hearts to receive what you want us to receive, to understand what you want us to understand, to see what you want us to see, and hear what you want us to hear. And Lord, I pray that you be glorified even tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In Revelation chapter 3, we're going to be in verse 14. I got a few precursor notes really quick that we'll go through. And then uh, we'll just see where, where we end up at. The roof is still leaking somehow. We thought we fixed it, and we didn't, obviously. So if you want to pay for a new roof, you can donate online. Amen. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hey, but seriously, if you guys do want to give on Wednesday night, uh, some people only come on Wednesday nights. Or schedules only allow for Wednesday night to come. You can give online, or there's also a Dropbox. So I just want to mention that. We don't take offering on Wednesday nights. But if you do consider this your church, and you want to give on Wednesdays, and you're only here on Wednesdays, that's totally cool, man. And... Um, just want you to know you can do that if you want to. All right, Church of Laodicea, let's jump right in, and um, we'll hopefully get to this whole, whole thing. The Church of Laodicea, the town had a population of about 75,000 to 100,000. It's a little bit smaller than Evansville. Uh, during the Roman times, the town became very, 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 I mean, very rich. They were wealthy. They were known for their wealth, and they were known for their clothes they exported abroad. So they had super nice clothes. They exported, they imported materials. This place had it going on. They had a lot of money behind them. And um, we see this, a common theme in the Bible. That it's hard for those who have a lot of money to enter into the kingdom of God. And there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. It's the love of money. Amen? And that's why a lot of people, I think, in the church, that God just won't trust you with a lot because he knows it's an easy temptation for you, man. It's easy. I think you see this a lot. You see this a lot. People sell out. Mm-hmm. People sell out. I'm telling you, people that start on the straight and narrow, the world, the fame, the noise, 
and it's easy to sell out and not stay pure. And so if God has blessed you with a lot of money, it's not just for you, it's for you that you can be a blessing, amen? And um, as the Bible says, Jesus said himself that it's better to give than it is to, yeah. So this church was really wealthy, man. So of the seven letters, if you talk about, whether you know, been in church or not, whether you've come to church a lot or not, this is the most popular. When they think of Revelation, the church and the letters, they think of the church of Laodicea only for one word, and the word is lukewarm, lukewarm. And so really the whole book of Revelation, that's people, if people ask what is it about, it's about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, and lukewarm. Um, that's where this comes from tonight. And we'll look and see why did he say that word. Anyways, they were super, super wealthy. I want you to mark that down if you're taking notes. This, this town, this city, this church was super wealthy. Um, they actually had a banking center. And this was a, they had an enormous banking center. So a lot of in and out of money, of exports, of imports, was taking place in the city of Laodicea. Um, it was also known for their school of medicine and its treatment for eyes. Like the people would travel all over the world to get treatment for eyes. And so um, you'll see this in the scripture when we read it in just a few moments. There's something about the eye. If you notice about every church in these letters, Jesus, through John, pinpoints it to a T and uses language that the church could understand. And we're going to see that even tonight with the word lukewarm and something about the eye. The city was also very Christian. My goodness, they were also very Christian. They didn't suffer a lot of persecution. A lot of the other churches did. This city did not suffer a lot of persecution, um, which is interesting that they didn't suffer a lot of persecution. They had a lot of money. So from the outside looking in, this church seemed to have it going on. Let's see, that can be a lot of churches, can't it? From the outside in, a lot of churches around our city can seem to be boom, popping and going and growing. And, and then you get in, it's like, uh, not everything meets the eye is true and this is going to set this it's going to set the springboard here for this church laodicea listen to this they didn't have they didn't have any natural springs of water so they had to go get water from the north or from the south okay so in the north it was cold no no in the north it was hot and in the south it was cold so it's kind of mixed it's backwards but in the north they had to go get hot water and in the south they would get cold water they had no water so they built this big, like, you can go study this more. We're not here to talk about, like, the ancient times. But they built this big, huge thing that they guarded with their life and how the water came in and out. But they didn't have any water. By the time they would get the water, it would be lukewarm. And if you've ever tasted a lukewarm drink, it's automatically, you want to spit it out. Right? Lukewarm coffee. People, there's some weirdos like that. You weird, bro. You just lukewarm. Right? That's like hot coffee with ice in it. That's different than iced coffee. Iced coffee is where the glory lives, amen? Hot coffee, I don't know. But hot coffee with ice, that's lukewarm, man. That's, ugh. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of the church is. That's where a lot of Christians are. The world takes a bite of you, and they're like, ugh. They see you cuss out your worker, but you go to church? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Be careful. How you act, how you live, you can be set in a lukewarm tone. Be careful. Who notices it the most? Your children. I just had a conversation with somebody. I don't know. I had a bunch of meetings today. Someone was talking about children. And we were talking about how much they absorb, even though it doesn't seem like they're looking. You could be the best witness out here, but if you're terrible in your house, bro, sit down somewhere. I promise. I promise you will, ne God will never trust you to lead something outside if you can't take inside well. And you have, sometimes this is hard for ministry, man, because you're so quick and going and minister to everybody else, but you never minister to your own family. I pray that as I get older and my kids get older and they come to the age of accountability and start knowing what's going on and what dad does, which Blayton does to an extent, that they say dad was the same at home as he was on stage on Sundays. So many ministers, so many Christians hate Christianity because they're parents. You go talk to a lot of people that are on bars tonight, they'll say, I was raised Christian, but my parents were an awful example. Come on, man, raise the bar. Before you reach anybody else, go after them well. Love them well. Don't overlook them. 
God's gifted them as arrows in your quiver to shoot them out. Hmm. I don't want to be a lukewarm parent. Amen? On fire on Sunday, cold the rest of the week. Mm -mm. I want to be on fire on Thursday night when no one's home, just as I am on Saturday night prayer. Amen? All right, let's keep going. So they had no water. This is a problem. This is a major problem. Oh, my. The water from the area is also, it had this, it's, it's this effect. They, listen to this. The doctors in this area would get the water that was transported to Laodicea and use it as medicine because it would automatically make people throw up. There was something in the water that they knew that if I drink it, it's going to make somebody throw up. So the doctors would use this water that they would get transported in to make people throw up. That's crazy. Beyond being lukewarm, it had chemicals in the water. If you still, there's ancient, like, I don't know what they call them. I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not like a geologist. But you can see where there's material and makeup from these chemicals on these pipes. Imagine that in your water. It's already lukewarm, and now you're just, that's a big old mess. I'm driving this home to say, let's not be the church that's a big old mess. Amen? That though we have the right thing, it just tastes wrong. It just comes across the wrong way. I pray that we would be a church that is just in love with Jesus on Monday afternoon when you get a bad report than you are Sunday morning at the altar. And we don't change and we don't alter and we don't fixate off that, amen? All right, let's keep going. Anything else before we read? I want you to get this. This is, this is I want you to take this note. I want you to mark this down. The devil, this is straight facts. The devil wants every Christian church like the church of Laodicea. I promise. Satanists will tell you this. If you read about the cults, I pray you don't do that. Don't, don't go down that rabbit trail, but if you've ever studied that stuff, they'll tell you they are, they are assigned to churches. I'm about to preach it. Satanists are assigned to churches, particularly charismatic churches particularly those that allow speaking in tongues with no interpretation. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because many pastors don't understand what, the, the, what that is. So let us let people speak in tongues all the time. The demonic has a form of tongues. They're cursing people as they are doing that. I promise. Satanists are not afraid of making a profession of Jesus. That's how they gain respect with people. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you this. We don't have time to go down that whole rabbit trail. That's another teaching for another night. I, I so want to because that will unlock for a lot of you some, some eye openers. But the devil wants every Christian church like this church. Look really good from the outside. Inside, it's a big old mess, man. Hmm. This church was lukewarm. They refused to make decisions. They compromised. They compromised. They lacked relationships, love, enthusiasm, commitment, righteousness, and integrity spiritually. And it means that their church's nature is completely incompatible with Christ. The church was arrogant. You ever been to an arrogant church? You ever had an arrogant pastor? You don't say amen. Praise not me, man. But you ever been around arrogant men and women of God? Think they know everything? Think there's no fault in them? That you're always the problem? This was this church. They were compromised. How many Christians have compromised today? Because you're afraid of getting unfollowed. You're afraid of people leaving your van. You're afraid of people leaving your marching team. You get what I'm talking about. We've compromised. Compromised Christians will be the first casualties. When times get hard, those who've compromised the truth will not make it to the end. If you compromise in this hour, there's no way you're gonna make it what's coming. I promise, we need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Prepare to give your life as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 says that. It's your duty and honor to give your body up to the Lord. It's a respectable worship, a sign of worship. Jesus said, there's coming an hour when those who are true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship in truth if you've compromised the truth. <laughs> They prided themselves, this church prided themselves on being rich and not needing anything. Back then, they had a huge earthquake, destroyed the whole city. 
the Romans actually came to this church and said, let us help you rebuild your church. And they refused. They said, we don't need your help. We're so wealthy, we can build it from the ground up again. And there's actually pillars inside this church. Listen to this. There's pillars that they built inside this church. You know what it says on the pillars? They engraved it. It says, by our own might. Mm-hmm. By our own might. How many Christians live with that motto? By my own might. You don't, you won't engrave it yourself, but it's already been engraved by God over you. Come on, man. I pray we're not a church that does it by our own might. How do you know when you're doing it? You're by your own might. You never take help. You try to do everything. You never go to the Lord first. You always go to him last. How many of you get a bad report, you automatically call somebody? You get a good report, you automatically call somebody. Something wild in your day happens, you automatically have that person you go to. Don't you? Or no, none of you do. You're just looking at me. Right, I did. God had to remove him out of my life so that I could go to him first. With everything, good, bad, ugly, indifferent. Some of you have allowed people to become your idols and you're living on the manna of man rather than the voice of oceans and waters of the Lord. <laughs> so many of you are echoes. You're not a voice. You echo what you've heard someone else say. But you don't have your own voice to speak what heaven say. Uh-huh. How do you become an echo? You read more books than you do the Bible. Oh, he's got someone crying already. This is how you become lukewarm. If you're not careful, this is how you will be lukewarm. You, been, you spend all this effort in other materials and other avenues, but you never get alone with God. Shut the door. Shut your phone off. Take the Apple Watch off. Take your earbuds out and just get on your, oh, get on your feet. Get on your knees and weep before the Lord. Say, God, forget the book. Forget the classroom experience. I want the real thing. And I don't need someone else to tell me. I want God to tell me. God will tell you, those who seek him with their whole heart, find them. The more you seek him, the more you will find him. I pray we will be a church that's known for seeking the Lord and abiding in his presence. I don't want to be an echo. The, voice, the earth does not need more echoes. They need a voice. The Bible says John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness, not an echo. I want to be a voice, Amen. Oh my gosh. All right, Revelation 3. Whew. All right, let's just read and I'll come back to this. You guys okay? Yeah, I need my blood pressure's getting up. Not gonna be a lukewarm church. Not gonna be. You can be a lukewarm Christian. I'm not gonna be a lukewarm church. I'm not gonna be that lukewarm church. Whether it's 15 of us or 15,000, we ain't gonna be lukewarm. Promise you that. I promise you that as long as I'm the pastor of this church, it will not be lukewarm. I'll challenge you out the door. It will not be lukewarm. We're not going to compromise for the sake of drawing a crowd. We're not going to compromise for the sake of getting people in the seat. We're not going to compromise that because the more you compromise to get people in the seat, the more his presence goes out the door. <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading the New King James Version. It says this. And to the angel of the church, angel just means pastor, of the Laodiceans, write this. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So Jesus is calling himself here. I know your works, he says that to every church, that you are neither cold nor hot. <clears throat> but your translation is going to say something. I wish you were. This one says, I I would you were cold or hot. It just means I wish you were. I wish you were one of you. He said that not because, he's not talking about hell and heaven here. He's talking about something they can relate to. Either get all the way off or get all the way on. Remember they had to get cold water from the south and hot water from the north. So they understand cold and hot very well. He said, I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were the cold, refreshing spring of the spirit that just, man, just refresh those around you. I wish you were on fire, man, and just didn't care what else was going on around you. You just burned for the burning one. 
but because you're neither, here's what he says. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither caught, or <laughs> caught, you can be caught, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Another word for spew means spit. They would have known exactly what that meant because a lot of their culture, a lot of their city were doing that. They're spitting out the water they were drinking. Notice how personal Jesus is with this. Notice how personal this is, man. It's right on. If you ever get alone with the Lord and ask him to speak to you just from his word or from his Holy Spirit, he will speak to you spot on. Mm -hmm. Man can't ever speak to you spot on. They might hit the, they might hit the nail. God's going to drive the nail home. Be careful who you listen to, man. Be careful. So I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That doesn't sound good, does it? Listen to this. Here's what this is. If a person is lukewarm towards something, it means he hasn't rejected it. <laughs> but at the same time, he has by no means accepted it. <laughs> In the mind of God, a tepid response is equal to a negative response. What is tepid? Complacency. I allow that. I tolerate that. Mm -hmm. We talked about this weeks ago. What you tolerate, you put your acceptance on. And what you put your acceptance on is usually your fruit. It comes out of, I, I said a lot better last time. What you tolerate soon becomes your identity. Mm -hmm. How many of us are tolerating Jezebel? We haven't rejected her, but we haven't accepted her. You're tolerating her. He said that to one of the churches, you tolerate her. We talked about this a few weeks ago in prayer. How many, I believe 100, I would say 100. 99% of the American church tolerates Jezebel every day. And the music you listen to, and the movies you watch, on the things you scroll through. Mm -hmm. Oh, I promise. In the, in, in the intimidation that you use texting others. In the fear mongering you try to live under. In the lust that provokes your eyes. Instead of rejecting it, you don't necessarily accept it. You just tolerate it. Pray we would not be a church that tolerates sin. You root, you get that thing up by the root and get it out. Amen? So I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Verse 17, it keeps going. Because, here's what he says. Because you say, I am rich. Here's what he says. Here's what you say. The pastor, the leaders of the church, not, we're rich, bro. Mm -hmm. I am rich and I am increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's a major red flag is when you say you don't need anything. The Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Another word for meek is needy. And it's not needy and I need, I need, I need. It's I need God. It's every time I open this word, God, I need you to speak to me. Every time I go to prayer, God, I need you to align my will with your will. I don't need someone else's word. I need your word. I need you, God. I need you. From apart from you, I can do no good thing, nothing at all. It's the meek shall inherit the earth. There's a whole teaching on the meekness, man. God is about the meekness, the lowly, and the humble. The broken and the contrite. If you are not broken, God will never use you. Let me say that again. And if you don't stay broken, your assignment will have a completion date. You've got to stay broken until you go to heaven. A broken and contrite spirit. The Lord will not reject or despise. Come on. The, I, I see. There's so, it's so easy for pride to take in. Look how much I know. Look how fast I can preach. Look how good my prophecy was. No, shut up. Get on the floor. Stay on the floor and don't get up. Only let the Lord lift you up. Amen? Here's what he says. He says, you, have not, you don't need a nothing. They equate, listen to this. They equated the increase in material goods with spiritual blessing. How many churches do that? Huh? You equate you have God's favor by how much money you have on the offering not realizing the word Ichabod's over your doorpost, which means the Spirit of God has left. You know how easy this is to happen? I don't think you realize the severity of what is happening in the church today. I don't think... I, this is not a game you play. 
It's not a game. It's not something you check off. This is a lifestyle. This is, I'm the same. I am when I'm greeting at the door. On Friday night, when I'm asked to go to the bar, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm the same when no one else sees me, when everybody else leaves me. I'm the same. My value system is different. You can't hurt somebody who has a different value system. The humble have a different value system. Those who are meek have a different value system. Here's how you know. The meek get attacked, but don't attack back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Write it down. You're going to need it. If you don't need it tomorrow, you're going to need it in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because in this world, you will have trials and tribulation. But fear not, for I've overcome the world. The meek get attacked. Like, I, don't even care. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, whatever. My value system is with him. My identity is in him. Not what you say. But you realize how much you need him. This is the difference. This church thought they had it all figured out. I've been around some leaders of churches that think they have it all figured out. I promise. I promise. You hear just from the, out of the bend, in the mouth, the heart, the, it speaks, and you can hear the tone of it. It's a scary place to be. Here's what Jesus says. And knowest not, he says, you think you're this, but here's what you really are, that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's how heaven sees this church. Mm -hmm. That's how he sees that pride in that church. God hates pride. That's one of the things God hates. God hates seven things. That's one of the seven God hates is pride. The original sin, pride is selfishness. It's always rooted in selfishness. Pride's always rooted in selfishness. We see that with Satan. He wanted what God had. Selfish. Pride. I can get there. I can do it. By my own might. I don't need your help. It's what they engraved in the church. By our own might. You get where we're going? Heaven says, no, you're, a ter you're, you're, you're miserable. You're miserable. You're wretched. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. Listen to this. The tragedy... <laughs> lay in the fact that while this church gloated over material wealth, she was unconscious of her spiritual poverty, again indicative of the modern church. In the church in America, building a church is not that hard. I promise, if I preached a please good message, we'd be mega church by now. I promise, I can't tell you how many people have left our church because of things I say. That just, poof, I promise. The conversations I have with people that don't go longer, go, I can't take that anymore. Oh, so you want me to change the message for you? Just so you can get mad about the music being too loud later? No. The church has never been as big as it is in America, but we've never been as powerless as we've ever been. We're so powerless. We're afraid to push back on culture. We're afraid to call demons for what they are. We're afraid to challenge people. We're afraid to call a bluff a bluff. We're afraid to uh, call what is sin, sin. At the sake of being turned, oh, you hate speech. Just shut up. I'm gonna hate what God hates and love what God loves. And God hates sin. Amen? Think of how many church buildings there are across this nation that are massive. Massive. I got a phone call from one of the top five biggest churches in America. It about blew me away the other day. They called my cell phone. Listen to this. They called my cell phone. One of the pastors. It says Southeast Christian Church. You ever know where that church is? It's in Louisville. It's just, it has, you know how many people have? They have 30,000 people. One of their pastors called me on my cell phone. I said, are you asking me to come preach? This can't be. Your church will go to 15,000 next if I preach. <laughs> we get in there and start, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they preach. He called me and I had left, left the voicemail. I said, Southie, what is happening right now? Are they going to give me a money? Are they going to write a check for us? So praise God. He said, hey, how many full-time staff? Do what? I want to know some, something really way off. I said, how do you even get my number? He said, we've been thinking about you a lot up there in the, up there in the east at Redham Church. I was like, what? 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 Are you okay? Did you just Google churches and start calling? What? He said, and here's what he said. Here's what he said. He called, he left a voicemail. 
you call the church, it goes to my number. Like, it goes to my personal number. <clears throat> and uh, that's why I don't answer all of them, because I, I just, if it's important, you leave a voicemail. But it goes to my number, and he said, man, I called the church number, and it actually went to the lead pastor's number. That's refreshing. He said, that's refreshing. He said, you can't hardly get a hold of anybody anymore. I'm called to minister to you, and you can't get a hold of me? That's a problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I minister to him first, and then my job and responsibility is you. As a pastor, my, 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 you're not called to minister to me. I've been called in place here to minister to the people, to feed the sheep. Mm-hmm. And I can't feed the sheep unless I feed the Lord. Amen? When's the last time you ministered to the Lord? Be careful. Be careful. You let other people minister to you all day long. You minister to other people. You minister to yourself when you minister to the Lord. Did you know, if you, oh my gosh. If you're not careful reading the Bible, you can minister to yourself more than you minister to the Lord. You become religious with it, don't do it. Talk about get alone. Get on your knees, weep, cry, spit, snot, throw up. Do something besides sit there with a blank look on your face. And say, God, I'm here to minister to you. I don't need anything you have for me. I don't, want any, I don't want to hear your voice. I don't want to hear anything. I'm just here to minister to you. Here I am as a living sacrifice. God, let it be a sweet smelling aroma unto you. Stay there for an hour. Just press in. I'm not here to get a prayer answered. I'm not here to get breakthrough. I'm not here to get deliverance. I'm not here to get anything. I just want you in your presence. It's a next level, man. It's a next level. My goodness. Verse 18, we keep going. I counsel you to buy of me. Listen to what he says. Buy of me. Here's what he says. What are you going to buy? Gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. This verse, this verse, highlight it, tattoo it, do something with verse 18. This verse right here. You want to know what that is? That's sanctification. Mm -hmm. That's how you get sanctified. How? By of him. How do I buy of him? You spend time with him. And you offer your life for his. is the deep well of God. Let me say it again. I don't care. All the, voices are, all the verses are amazing. This one right here, if you want to learn how to grow in your Christian faith and not be a little doormat Christian, which we've got plenty of those around. It's talking about you want to go deep into the Lord. Buy of Him. Don't buy of man. Buy of Him. Can I share something with you? When I first started in ministry, listen to this. Um, when I first started ministry about seven years ago, um, I did not buy of God. I bought of men. And what I realized is as I bought of men, good men, man, whatever, YouTube, books, conferences, I went to all these things, man. I was sold out for it. Want more, want more, want more. I was not buying of the Lord. I was buying of men. Men's revelation can only lead you to the starting line of God's. I always felt empty after I'd read something. That was a good book. What's the next one? That was a good message. What's the next one? My soul wasn't fulfilled because it wasn't God speaking. That's a good supplement. Don't make that your main course. And I had so many different people speaking into me, man. So many different voices. Be careful how many voices you allow in your life. You can get confused. The more numbers you add, the more confusing it gets. Well, this person said that, and that person said this, and this person said this, and this minister posted that, and that person. What are you talking about? Get two or three trusted adults and pastors and leaders in your life and let them be the supplement of what God says in your private time. Simple. I'm trying to tell you how to not be empty inside. I promise. I know how, some of you are there. 
you put on a fake, and I know, I know, you think you're on fire Christian, you think you're amazing, you're, all, you're doing all these things, but inside you're empty. I used to be there, and here I am, working at the mission, ministering to men. I'm empty. I wasn't reading my Bible, I was reading other nonsense. The Word of God should be where we land it. Amen? The Lord convicted me, he said, you spend hours reading other materials, but you spend five minutes a day in my book. Why don't you flip-flop it? Life changed drastically when I made this my main thing and the other things supplement. I'm telling you to get rid of them. If God tells you to get rid of them, get rid of them. Just don't make it the main thing. Do you get what I'm saying? I love this. I could seriously, we could, we could stay on this verse for three weeks. Buy of me. What's he asking you to buy? Gold. Try it in the fire that you may be rich. Listen to this. What they needed to buy, what this church needed to buy, could not be purchased with money. You cannot buy the anointing. You cannot buy the favor of God. You cannot buy any of that nonsense. Don't let anybody ever juke you into paying for a blessing. There's ministers out there at play. Oh, just pay $99 and we'll send your healing rag. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. It's a foolishness. Don't buy it. Buy of God. What they needed could not be purchased with money, but only with the precious blood of Christ, which the price has already been paid. But most of the modern church is not interested. Mm -hmm. Gold tried by fire. You know what that is? Endurance. You know what that is? A long time. You know what that is? Staying put. You know what that is? Not moving. You know what that is? Abiding in the Lord. God's into the character building. He's not into the next jump over to the next hill. Many of you cut off your destiny because you jump from this place to that place to this place to this place to that place to this word to that word to this word. God wants you to stay and abide. Abide means wait and stay. God, we talked about it Sunday. God's into the longevity of building you as gold purified by fire. You cannot be purified by fire if you don't stay in the heat. Mm, my. Okay, we gotta keep going because I could preach on this verse literally. We can preach on this till the Lord comes back. To me, that's heavy meat right there. And most, most of us, it's easy to overread that. Okay, that was weird. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what that means, man. <laughs> Jesus says, You're gonna be rich in a white raiment that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. It says, to me, you're naked. To the world, you seem to be clothed, but to me, you're naked. And if you don't repent, you're going to be shown as naked. And anoint your eyes with eye salve. Here it is. This is this, see, he's talking about the eyes that you may see. He said, you are physically seeing, but you're spiritually blind. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The Lord is very clear about this. Those he loves, he chastises. Don't run when God chastises you. It's a sign you're a son or daughter of the Lord. It's not a sign that God hates you. It's a sign that God loves you. When you have healthy leaders that call out your bluff and your sin, don't run from them. Love them because they love you enough to tell you, honey, sir, child, pump the brakes. But many of us get offended easy, don't we? Many of you get offended easy because you're not abiding in him. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Just to repent, man. Repent is huge. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with me, just sit with him, and he with me. He sat outside the church and knocked, and nobody answered. I often wondered if Jesus showed up as he showed up in the earth to our church Sunday morning, would any of us recognize him? I believe a lot of us wouldn't. Jesus on the earth says he was born as any normal man. Do you notice when they went to arrest him, they said, where is he? They couldn't tell the difference between his disciples and Jesus. Jesus said, here I am. He had to come up from the crowd. Many of us think Jesus had this halo over his head. 
That was not the case. He was any average man who had the halo in his heart. <laughs> in the secret place, Jesus will not always appear in righteousness as we think he's going to. He's going to appear as a humble servant there to wash your feet. Let them wash your feet, man. I pray we'd be a church that just sits. And just let them wash us. You told Peter, why are you washing? I gotta, I gotta wash you, man. I gotta wash that stuff off you. I can't come into the next season. He said, wash my whole body then. Many of us go in the secret place and we expect some crazy encounter. And Jesus is sitting in the corner in the dark longing to be talked to, longing to be worshipped as the man of glory. But he often won't appear to that. Why? Because he wants to keep you low. He wants to, he wants to let you know he can relate to your hurt in your life. He can relate to the pain you're going through. He can relate to the nonsense at home that's going on that no one else sees. He can relate to the addiction late at night that no one else sees. He can relate to the loss you just experienced when it doesn't make any sense. He can relate to the financial breakthrough and, and, and his financial issues that's going on in your house that no one else can. He can relate to a church that seems to hate the pastor that no one else seems to, to love. He can relate to the servant who seems burned out and worn out and just wanted to throw up. He can relate to the mom who's so sick and tired of their son and daughter doing drugs. He can relate to the dad who's so sick and tired of working and not getting an acknowledgement from his wife. He can relate to every single person in the humble place of knowing him. Let him wash your feet. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, we see this in every single church, to him who overcomes, will I grant, give the right to, to sit with me in my throne. Mm -hmm. The overcomer will gain the prize of the throne, which can only be done by one ever making the cross the object of his faith. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Did you catch it? That God set Jesus in his throne, and Jesus wants to set you on his throne. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's why the Bible says we're seated. Yep. In heavenly places. Who? Those who overcome. Not through those who tap out. Can I, I'm going to get down my dag of it a little deeper and, and just real quick in just a second. Is that okay? That's not okay. You guys can leave. I'll preach to myself. I'll just cry myself. I, it's amazing when you can cry from your own preaching. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. Overcome. Don't stop. Just stay. Overcome. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then it stops. It stops. And we go to the throne of God. <laughs> Next week, you better bring your notebook. I'm going to teach you how to pray in a way God wants us to pray. I promise, you get this next week, your prayer life will change. Some of you just pray, you close your eyes, and you, don't, you try to picture God. You just don't know what to picture. Should I picture some heavenly being? Should I picture Jesus? Should I picture the Holy Spirit? Should I picture a dove? What should I picture? Any of you struggle with this when you pray? No, some of you are afraid to raise your hand. Mm -hmm. No, he wants to, he's, he's showing you the throne of God where God is seated that right now. Picture this, thunders, lightnings, weird creatures, man. Eyes all over the place. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Narnia-ish. Mm -hmm. Telling you, it's wild. You'll see these wings, six creatures, man. Eyes as they open up. Eyes on the back and eyes on the front. Oh, it's crazy. He wants you to go to that place. He wants you to come up high. Lift it up where he is. Amen. Goodness gracious. Listen to this. A 
Affluence, which means doing well for yourself, can easily drown out one's need for Jesus. <laughs> you ever made you ever made it in the workplace? Oh, now I'm making fifty thousand dollars a year. Oh, we made it. Oh, it's seventy five. Oh, I push I push six figures. Oh man, we, we're doing well now. The more affluence you have, the less Jesus you need. Mm -hmm. In the natural, it's gonna counteract everything. The more you have, it's, it takes that neediness away. And I'm not telling you to sell everything. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not telling you to, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you, just don't let that become something in your life that is your identities behind. Here's a, here's, this is a question for you tonight, church. Do you love God, the giver, more than you love the gift? <laughs> do you love the gift or the giver more? How do I know? By the tone of your prayer. By the tone of your prayer. So if you check this tonight, when you go home and pray tonight, check what you pray for. If it's only gifts or what God can give you, you love the gift more than you love the giver. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you just prayed, God, thank him for who he is? Yeah. Thank you, God, that you're my righteous king. Thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, God, that you made a way when there was no way. Thank you, God, for being my life and my truth and my way to heaven. Thank you, God, for reaching me when no one else could. Thank you, God, for running me down when everybody else left. Thank you, God, for never forsaking me or never leaving me, even though the crowd did. Thank you, God, for delivering me when I was full of demons. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God, for healing my body when I was full of sickness. Thank you, God, for saving my soul that one day I may be in heaven with you walking streets of gold in the presence of Yeshua. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus, that you stick closer than a brother. Thank you that you have never left me nor forsaken me. Thank you that you see me even when everybody else does it. Thank you you catch my tears late at night on my pillow. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. When's the last time that prayer just, you need to erupts, man. Heaven will get you, you will get heaven's attention when you pray like that. He'll, he'll tap his angels. Look at this one. Look at this one. God will start to brag about you. God will, God brags about those who honor him. Let me say that again. God brags about those who honor him. He's a jealous God, not a prideful God. He's just a jealous God. He knows he's worthy, but he doesn't tell himself. He created us to do it for him. <laughs> you ever met those people that are good and they know it? And nobody else tells them until they tell themselves? Uh-huh. Some of you are that person. Careful. How many of you ever met a person that, that you know you're standing in, the, in, 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 like, different realms with people? And they just don't say anything about it. They know they can pull the trump card any time. But they don't. It's humbleness. God created you and me to be a part of the redemption of the world. And tell them, God, you're worthy. Whew. My goodness. You guys okay? You sure? <sighs> I have a few more questions for you, and then I want to drive something else. We, we might just pray and end it tonight. Do you see yourself from your own perspective or how someone else sees you, or do you see yourself how God sees you? Notice the two differences. They saw themselves as not needing anything rich, taken care of. God saw them as being naked, miserable, and afraid, man. Be careful how you see yourself. Let God show you who you are. And if it's not good, you know what he gives you? He gives you a chance to become good. <laughs> he didn't leave this church. He actually opened the door for them to come to repentance. Gold refined by fire. What that means, it means under pressure. God is a God who works under pressure. Say it again. God is a God who works under pressure. He does his best work under late circumstances. He does his best work when the time limit's about ready to hit zero. Mm -hmm. Kevin and I were just talking about this today. Talking about the building. Some of you, some of you, you can testify that God shows up last minute. Doesn't he? 
talking about a building, we need a new building, more space. We're blowing out of this place in every area. I said, yeah, last time in Newburgh, God waited until we were standing room only. They were literally, we had people in the atrium. I said, I think he's going to do it again here. And then he's just going to miraculously provide something in our lap. <laughs> he waits last minute. Why? So you can build faith and trust in him. That's why he waits last minute. If he always did first minute, there's no way to have faith in that. There's no way to trust something. Under pressure. And you know what? If God works under pressure, he wants you to too. The pressure... Oh my gosh. The pressure will either break you and cause you to run back home or it will press you up higher to him. I promise. God was offering deep intimacy with himself. He said, come by of me. That's intimacy. Yeah, I promise. I believe that's how God feels sometimes when he looks at you. And me too. It's like, there's so much more for you, Caleb. What are you doing? And not in a condemning way. I'm just talking about like in a deep way, man. I want to know him intimately, like you know your spouse. Why? Because he shares his secrets with those who, he what? We don't know that word. Fear him. Those who fear him, he shares his secrets. I heard a message the other day. He explained it well. See, some of you know me as Pastor Caleb. Friend Caleb, awesome grass mower Caleb, Mr. Fix It Caleb, right? Skinny Jean Caleb. Some of you know me on a more intimate level, but none of you will know me on the level Danielle knows me. She knows me as best friend, she knows me as the ultimate supporter, she knows me as lover. None of you are ever gonna know me as lover. Yeah, get that out of your head right now, you sickos. Right? Come on. Why? It's intimacy. You don't share your secrets with everybody. Some of you have learned the hard way. Shut up. Not everybody is able to handle the secrets God gives you. God wants to give you his secrets in intimacy, but he won't do it if you're not close to him. Psalm 91, let's go there really quick. And then we're just going to pray at the end. I believe we're just going to pray. Man, I don't know what's going to happen, Kevin, but we're just going to pray. Psalm 91, let me get here. Now, a lot of you can quote this scripture. A lot of you guys read this over yourself during the COVID nonsense. All right, this is like the scripture that was going around on Facebook, if you remember, two years ago. And a lot of you guys like verse 2. No, a lot of you guys like, no, sorry. A lot of you guys like the end of verse one. We'll rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You guys like that verse? Some of you like, I'm not sure where you're going, so I'm not sure if I'm saying yes or no. <laughs> we'll rest under the shadow of his wings, right? A lot of you say that. Did you know there's a prerequisite to get under his wings? <laughs> there's a prerequisite to get under God's wings. Here's what it says. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, there's the word abide, under the shadow of the Almighty. Some of you, oh, some of you overlook the secret place and think you abide under God's shadow. You don't. Can I just tell you for what it is? You don't. This is scripture. This is my, not me. Oh, your pastor being me. No, it's not me. It's me and it's scripture. He who dwells in the secret place. If you don't have no secret place, you often have secret sin. Awful quiet in here now. Let me tell you this. If you don't have the secret place daily, you'll have the secret, you'll have secret sin daily. I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. Because everybody has secrets, don't we? It's quiet, man. Mm hmm. 
he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you want to abide under his wings, you got to first go to the secret place and dwell there. Here, notice this. You wait in the secret place, God will literally place you under his wings, and he still gives you the choice to come out from under it or not. Okay. We're going to pray. And Kevin, if you feel a song, sing a song. But we're going to pray. I've given out a lot tonight. The lukewarm church, I'm not really concerned about that. Now, don't, don't take that the wrong way. The lukewarm church, it's a church of compromise, man. It's a church that just floats along. It's a church that wants to be, have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. It's a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians. Oh, this is how the, the theology of hyper grace comes in. That God saved me so now I can do whatever I want to. That's not Bible. God's grace saved you so that you could become more like him and less like yourself. Amen? So we're going to pray. We're just going to thank the Lord for who he is. If you want to come up here and repent or whatever, man. Wednesdays are a little bit more intimate. Maybe you just need to come down and ask God, God, how do you see me? How do you really see me? Not how I don't see myself, not do what others say about me. How do you see me from heaven? If it's good, thank him. If it's bad, repent. And then thank him again that he showed you. It's the goodness of God that leads us mm -hmm, to repentance. People think repentance is some awful word. It's, it's the first word Jesus said. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. As we pray, I'm going to pray, and then you just pray, man. You take it out. Pray out loud. Thank God for who he is. Just thank him. Just, just I promise you something's going to happen when you just thank God. Don't pray for what you need. Don't pray for your kids. Don't pray for your marriage. Don't pray for your church right now. Don't pray for any of that stuff. Just thank God for who he is. Thank him that he's allowed you to be a part of what he's doing on the earth. Some of you just, oh, I'm telling you, some of you just need to fear God more. You need to fear God more. And I can't teach you how to do that. I can tell you until I'm blue in the face. Pastor Trevor and I were talking about this the other day. If our church would get the fear of the Lord, we'd see, we'd, you wouldn't, you couldn't even explain what you'd see. Many of us in the church today don't fear the Lord. You love Jesus, you just don't fear God. I said, you love Jesus. That's not the problem. The problem is you don't fear God. You don't have an awe and reverence. The fear of the Lord is being intimidated by not being with him. It's being so afraid of not being with God. Some of you run from God because you have things to hide. Others of you run to God because you already know he knows everything. Come on, man. I believe God wants to touch his people tonight, man. Come on, man. I'm talking about you fear the Lord. I pray that God would baptize us right now in the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It's one of the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself delighted in the fear of the Lord. The Bible says that Jesus took delight in the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Once the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes on, you will love what God loves and you will hate what God hates. I promise, the fear of the Lord, man. It's the fear of the Lord. It's the answer. It's how you keep from being lukewarm. It's how you keep from compromising. It's how you go from the next level, from glory to glory and faith to faith. It's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord will open you up to the secret place. You'll understand you can't spend a day without going to the secret place. Whether it's five minutes or five hours. God, do it now. Do it, God. All over the room, do it right now in Jesus' name. Fear the Lord right now. Come in the room, Lord. Baptize us with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Do it. Do it in Jesus' name. Do it in Jesus' name. Increase in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. More, Lord. More, God. More. Just thank him.
Do it, God. Do it. Do it. Raise him up. Raise him up. Raise him up. Do it. He's raising you to new heights. He's raising you to new heights. this place, man. You won't be able to go home the same. Pray that his eyes of fire would come and just pierce your heart. We need the fire of heaven to pierce through the sin of our life. Come on, once you plant, once you catch, once you catch, oh my gosh, once you catch a glimpse of his eyes, it's game over. Come on, the eyes of fire, just let it penetrate your soul. Come on, cry out for him, God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you've chosen us. Chosen us to be vessels of the Holy Ghost. You've chosen us to be marks on the page of your story. You've chosen us in Evansville, Indiana, out of all the places of the earth, to be a part of your story. Every single person in here tonight, you hear how old you are, how young you are, what gender you are, what your background is, what your socioeconomic status is, what your race is. He has called you to be a part of his redemption store to the earth. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. He pass you by. Don't you take it for granted. Don't let God pass you by. Fear him so much. You get his attention. Say, God, whatever you don't, don't pass me and my family. Don't pass me and my family. Some of you just need to pray tonight that God wouldn't pass you in your family. Come on, for the sake of generations. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the blood, Lord, that though our sins be as scarlet, the blood of Jesus washes them white as snow. There's power in the blood tonight, church. There's power in the blood. God, break off any compromise in our life, any toleration of darkness in our life. Break it off. I'm tired of compromising. I'm tired of being a casual Christian. How do you know if you're a casual Christian? You're going to know in your heart. You're going to know in your heart. You're trying to fake people out trying to pretend to be something you're not. If that's you, man. Just come on. Just come out of that. Just come up and out of that. Quit, quit lying to yourself. The devil wants you to sit there and be a casual Christian your whole life. Come out of that. Come out of that tonight. Come out of that tonight. Just come out of that tonight, man. Just, just give it all. Give it all. I promise you. I promise you, you will never regret giving your all to God. The world comes and goes, money comes and goes, fame comes and goes, but the word of the Lord, hallelujah, is that the word of the Lord shall last forever. Come on, the fear of the Lord is the answer, church. It's the, it's the beginning of wisdom. I'm just, gonna give you some, I'm just gonna give you some promises from the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of discernment. It's, the, it's how you live long life. Mm -hmm. The mercy of God. Listen to this. The mercy of God is on those who fear him. It's Luke 1.50. The favor of God is on those who fear him. 
the successful life of a Christian is for those who fear him. Mm -hmm. The key to life is Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes. You know the key to life? Go read the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the last chapter, I believe. One of the wisest men ever wrote that book. He said, I've come to figure this out about life. This is the meaning of life. To forget all, based on paraphrasing, he says, to forget all that, all that other stuff and to fear the Lord. The wisest man ever lived wrote that. And we're so casual with the Lord. That's why the Bible says that the foolishness of God mm -hmm, is wiser than any man. It says the wisdom of man is foolishness unto God. the Lord, man. It's the fear of the Lord. If you got to go, you got to go. You can get up and go whenever you want to. We're not holding you down. The fear of the Lord, man. I'm telling you, once our church gets it, I once, and it doesn't have to be all of us. Once a fourth of us get, once just a Wednesday night service of 70 to 90 to 100 people in a room, once we get this, it's game over. Come on, man, just ask him. God, give me the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I'm tired. I'm tired of running in the muck. I'm tired of running in the cycles of life where I have a good season and then an awful season. We do really good and then we do really bad. I seem to have breakthrough for two weeks and then I go 15 steps back the next three weeks. The fear of the Lord will keep you steady. The fear of the Lord will keep you grounded. The fear of the Lord will keep you in the refining fire. The fear of the Lord will keep you on the ground. It's hard to make a mistake when you're on the ground. Come on. If you need it, just ask him. Ask him. He's a good guy. He wants to give it to you. Just ask him. You have the fear of the Lord. Just say, God, I need the fear of the Lord in my life. I need it. If you're desperate enough to ask out loud, ask out loud. God, give me the fear of the Lord. Give me the fear of the Lord. It's the key to life. It's the key to life. The fear of the Lord, God, come upon me now in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Come on. It's the fear of the Lord. I'm telling you, it's the answer to life. You will not be lukewarm when you fear the Lord. I promise you, you will not be lukewarm. There's a holy hunger for the Lord. The Bible says, The blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Some of you just aren't hungry enough, man. You're just, you're just okay with status quo Christianity. I'm not. I am not. The key to this, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us tonight. The key to this is when you leave this place tonight, you keep this same attitude, keep this same spirit as you go home. Don't put on a show. Stay on your knees in the closet. Weep in the bedroom. Spend time with God in the morning. Spend time with God in the afternoon. Just like Daniel, he said he prayed three times a day. That's just publicly. I'm privately, that boy was, he didn't leave the prayer closet. Don't let a moment go by that God's not with you and that you're not with God, man. I'm not talking about the omnipresence of God. God's everywhere, I get that. I'm talking about the abiding in the Lord. Once you understand you have to abide in God to do everything, You'll never leave the branch, man. You'll never leave that vine. You'll never leave the vine. man you can be dismissed anytime you want to be you want to stay and linger you stay and linger
things are rare. God wants this to become the norm of church where God meets the church on the earth and the kingdom of God collides with his people. Do not overlook moments where God kisses the earth, man, I promise. In intimacy, he's putting a stamp of approval on his people. you need just shows up. The answer today, some of your prayers just showed up in the room and you don't even realize it because you're just worried about praising him. <laughs> yep, even this week, some of you are going to get your answer to the prayer you've been praying for for five months and it was your praise he wrote in on. It was just your praise, man. It wasn't your eloquent prayer, it was your praise.
Thank you. 